first and foremost, it has to function well. Um, and then the challenge with everything is blending the the form and making it look cool and interesting and unique and you know make sure it looks good in pictures, whatever it is, to blend that into the function. Because we are very well aware that we exist in a very digital world. And the likelihood that someone is actually going to touch a knife before they purchase it is ever dwindling. So it has to look good in a picture on a website. So if it doesn't look good in a picture on a website, nobody's gonna get that knife in their hand to see how useful and see how nice it is. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 36 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. And Bob, first we have to begin the show with an apology. We uh, we missed a week, daggone it. We did indeed. And actually, it's mostly an apology to ourselves, Jim. I, I know we were trying to get yeah. 52 straight episodes. And, uh, well, somewhere along the line, I went on vacation and something huh. happened. So. Life gets in the way, man. <laughs> <laughs> At least it was in a good way and not but, uh, the way it right. gets in, in the bad way. So. Right. But you've already got a, a lot of great shows uh, planned uh, for the next several weeks. We're not going to give away uh, uh, who the guests are or anything like that. But we've got uh, several interviews already, uh, as they say, in the can and several mm -hmm. more planned. So uh, some uh, good knife makers and YouTubers and uh, folks in the knife community coming up. So uh, something to look forward to. Maybe a, maybe a, a week away, we'll, uh, we'll do our listeners good. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lots of good knife conversation coming up. Right, right. What's on the uh, show today, Bob? Uh, today we're speaking with uh, Elliot and Chris Williamson, uh, brothers who have uh, who formed uh, Ferrum Forge, a very popular uh, knife outfit out west. And uh, I'm very interested in talking to them about their sort of multimodal production method of putting m knives out. They they uh, they work in their own shop with their own hands. Uh, they have some OEM work done, and then they have some full on collaborations with with some other companies going on. So they're they're covering the the they're covering the gamut, and it's very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast. I want to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Self-Employed. Uh, QuickBooks Self-Employed is your year-round tax solution. It's a must-have for contractors, freelancers, self-employed knife makers, perhaps. If you go to the thenifejunkie.com slash QB30, that's QB30, You'll get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free. Go to thenifechunky.com slash QB30. That interview with the Williamson brothers of Ferrum Forge is coming up next. Visit the Knife Junkie online at thenifejunkie.com. First of all, Chris and Elliot Williamson from Ferrum Forge. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. So uh, you just came back from Blade Show a couple uh, weeks back. And, uh, you know, we just were recently uh, speaking with uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny about what it's like to be a collector at Blade Show. I would love to know what it's like from your perspective. What's it like being uh, knife makers uh, and showing at Blade Show? Well, I got to say our experience this year was uh, very unique. Vastly uh, different. Than our, what most people are going to experience. 2015 experience. And especially our 2015 experience. Because we were there in the mass drop now drop uh, booth. So we saw it from a very different perspective than the guys at the tables or even more people back in the uh, the booths in the back corners. So well, you, you mentioned your 2015 experience. Uh, what, what was that like? In 2015, we, uh, we got a booth and we brought about 100 knives with us. We worked our tushies off here and slaved away. And oh, we got we got so excited. This shirt that Christopher is wearing, it's a for they those can't who can't see, see it podcast. is a gorgeous faux tuxedo shirt. It's very classy, very mm -hmm. classy. We also we had foam fingers as well. I mean, we tried to try to keep it real classy there at the booth. So any anything you could do to bring people in, really? No. I'm yeah. Sorry. No, seriously. <laughs> well, That's we knew that our booth was way in the back. I got you. But but uh, you guys have been kind of uh making knives uh and kind of visible for a number of years. I, uh, I guess 2015 is right back at the, uh, at the, at the beginning. Uh, what did you sell everything at that show or? We absolutely did not. Oh, 
So for for years, like we've been uh, going as voyeurs to the California Costume Show, okay, and uh, and kind of seeing what that show felt like. That show's pretty mellow, pretty small, and I was like, all right, I I think I'm ready for for this thing because all of my knife maker friends are like, oh, you got to go to Blade LA, you got to go, dude, you could just bring everything, dude, you're gonna sell everything, it's gonna be amazing, <laughs> and it was not quite that amazing. Uh, hmm. I think we had some some bad booth placement. Our, do our expectations we were. were very high as well. That's part of it. Remember, we were so excited. Like, we're going to make so much money. It's, it's going to be, be awesome. incredible. It's going to be so and, exciting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, managing expectations can be yeah. uh, can be difficult. So you're there. You're kind of uh, creating a new paradigm of production in that uh, you're making knives in your custom shop. You have your pro series. Um, you, you are making a lot of knives through drop, or a lot of your designs are being produced through the drop formerly known as mass drop. And uh, it, so you're, you've got your hands on a very broad spectrum of knife making and, and the knife market. How did you get here? Where, where did you start? What got you into making knives? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, the, the, <laughs> that was an enormous question. I don't think he knows how enormous that question was. The, the early days are all you, dude. <laughs> okay. All right. So th- this all starts with our grandpa and oh. that, that crazy bastard, um, gave me a knife when I was four years old. And that's just insane. I wasn't the kind of four-year-old you want to give a knife to. What was he thinking? But he did it. And then it was just knives for my entire life ever since then. I've always been the guy with a knife. And then in my my late teen years, my uh, my taste in knives was outgrowing my uh, financial situation. <laughs> and so I started to kind of like get curious about like, man, why is this knife so much more money than this knife? Like what? What is going on here? What's the difference? Because before I didn't know anything. Just your grandpa gave me this one. Great. All right. That's the knife I'm carrying. A lot of slip joints. A lot of slip joints. A lot of case knives. Yep. Yep. A lot of case knives. A lot of old timers. Some straight action in there. Oh, yeah. The classy stuff. Oh, yeah. And then through the college years, I basically learned how to research. And so I started doing a lot of research. And that was research into the quote unquote knife community, looking at, uh, you know, like high end art knife makers and i was like holy shit what we get in the store is garbage Hmm. wow compared to what is being done out there in the world and so that was fascinating and then as i was also asking the question of why do some of these things cost so much money that got me into some material science and i actually found i really liked that a lot it's an understatement (laughs) and it all kind of culminated when I was taking a class on the Iliad and the Odyssey, and there was this reference. Yeah, it gets geeky. It gets real geeky. Get ready. And, I don't know. I can get there with you. And there's this, uh, <laughs> there's this simile in the Odyssey when Odysseus sticks the, uh, the stake into Cyclops' eye, and it's this direct reference to the heat treatment of steel. And I went, that's weird, because I thought this was a Bronze Age book. I thought we were, we were in the Bronze Age. Why are they talking about the heat treatment of steel? And so that led me on a, a super nerdy uh, literary slash material science research paper that just got completely out of hand. And the professor, that this is for like a, a, a Greek classics class. And this guy was also one of my Latin professors. And he was like, what, what is wrong with you? You are so unbelievably weird, but you go down with your bad self. I ask that question every day, brother, <laughs> every day. So uh, for those of you who don't remember the Odyssey, Odysseus is stuck in a cave. He's got to get himself out. See, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I know you're not the only one. So he, he hews a, a, a giant piece of wood into a spear and hardens it in the fire. And then he quenches it in the giant's eye, basically. Is that what yeah. you're... Yeah. And then, like, the, the like, exact line is, and it made the sound is, like, when you dip hot steel, well, iron or steel, depending on the translation, hot steel into water... Because that's what gives it its strength. And I was like, what? What is this doing in here? This this is so, this is like hundreds of years after where this is supposed to be in the timeline for, for literature. I was like, hmm, curious. Turns out there's probably like seven or eight people in the world that are having a, a deep uh, academic debate about this subject. <laughs> probably emailed all of them. It got weird. So you're basically a genius. Don't even know it. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how did, when did the knife making start? So I had, I was already kind of dabbling and this is why it was so interesting. I was, I was dicking around just like shaping found pieces of metal in my garage 
And, uh, and then it became, okay, I'm going to build a, a forge. So I built like a duck pot forge out of a brake rotor and a shop vac. And then I started hammering hot pieces of metal into vaguely knife-shaped objects. That's all I can describe them as. <laughs> Not knives. <laughs> that's, that's the best I can give you as well. Yeah. Sorry, bro. It took me about <laughs> six months of, of dicking around with that to go, that is a really hard way to make a knife. I feel like there's just way better ways to do this. And that's kind of where I got into stock removal. And uh, and then eventually it got, man, I'm really getting tired of like straightening leaf springs. This is getting stupid. I bet I can just buy this stuff. And then I found Alpha Knife Supply. And then it was getting into steel. And then it got super geeky with steel. And then it just started to evolve in doing stuff on the weekends and whenever I had free time. And then in 2012, I actually made my first folder, and that was the beginning of the end. So is there a, a part of the process of making a folder that obviously it, it captured you in a different way than attempting to forge or forging? Oh, yeah. What is it about that process that you guys find so capturing? What is it that is more appealing to you than hitting stuff with a hammer? Because <laughs> I know that that it's one of your, your loves in this world. So. Chris and I, uh, our, our dad's side of the family, they're, um, what's the right word for what they are? They're, uh, uh, they're very analytical, very logic-based people. Uh, there's a couple of engineers in the family. Uh, you know, retentive. Yeah, well, that's uh, a nice way to put it, too, I think. Um, detail-oriented. That's the detail-oriented? Yeah, yeah, we'll go with detail-oriented. Like, uh, our, our dad was a professional athlete. He played professional baseball. And before he got drafted into, um, into the Padres minor league system. He was actually getting a degree in engineering. Uh, we have an actual aerospace engineer uncle who does things he can't talk about. Um, and then like on the other side of the family, we got people in aerospace here in San Diego. So there's just aerospace and engineering just swirling about us all the time. So there's, there's just a little something that I really enjoy about making something that's mechanical. And then being able to do that by hand is, was crazy. Like the first time I made a folder that actually uh, worked because there were ones that didn't work very well. Sure. The first one that actually worked, I was like, oh my gosh, it works. It, it must have felt closes. like magic. Yes. You were very excited magic. about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I, I get the pleasure of getting to see those kinds of things today. Some of the old, old first stuff and go, oh, 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 wow. Come a long way. A real long way. So are, are you both, um, this is going to be an awkward question. Or, just or, go for let, it. let me just let me just ask you this way: in in which direction do your are your skills divided? Are you both equally good at at uh, everything, or do you have your strengths? And I mean, obviously, you work together. Your brothers, you collaborate. You're uh, kind of um, part of this uh, tip of the spear that's um, turning knife making into a super collaborative process, which I can relate to. I come from production, and everything you know, everything of value comes from um, you know adding other people's perspectives, at least in what I do. So I'm, I'm kind of seeing what you're, what you're doing. We don't think you're wrong there at all. Um, we've definitely seen some wonderful results from, from getting people together. And what do you think? Getting what the, do you think? The right well, you're clearly together. an idiot, so you don't get to talk. No, that's not how it goes. No, we're inclusive. And I only said that to you like two times, okay? <laughs> Shut up, Elliot. You're stupid. <laughs> Stop it, Chris. It's me. But so... As similar as we are, I think we do have pretty different personality types. Ooh, yeah. um, I'm definitely the serious one. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Happy Gilmore, the scenes with Lee Trevino where he just shakes his head disapprovingly, <laughs> that's basically my job for the entire business. Yep. Definitely my conscience when it comes to like <laughs> it, well, it works pretty out. much everything at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one of the few people I actually listen to in this world. You're the order to his chaos. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, bud. <laughs> Love you, bro. Need you both. Well, back in the beginning, when I first roped him into this stuff, uh, like it was, it was just him coming over on the weekends and helping me do things in the garage. And one of the things that I, I like about him is that he's the closest thing I have in this world to a clone. And no. so, no, well, <laughs> I haven't cloned me yet. Okay. They won't let me. Stay so I knew he was going to have like, like a lot of the things that I possess that are, are innate. And which he does. And then he's got this whole other package that I just don't have, namely the ability to say no to ideas. And um, I would say that you are a, uh, a much more cognizant of fiscal matters than I am. 
That's a really great way of putting it. <laughs> well, uh, so tell us a little bit about your process. Uh, I don't know. Do you have a typical process? Kind of. Kind. Of, it, it's getting well, slightly more typical. So, in terms of the uh, you know the separation of duties within the company, uh, Elliot is my design guy. Oh, yeah. He is from day one in the garage with drawing stuff out on a piece of metal with sharpie, cutting out with a the angle grinder, Love right, angle shaping grinder. everything down. Still uh, have it. Still so, use it. Yes. Um, it so, shit, bro. Sometimes he's he's definitely evolved over the years from drawing out stuff on graph paper and just kind of working it out as he went to 2D basic CAD line drawings that we were using once we started doing water jet and uh, using other machine shops. And now he's into full 3D well, CAD. There, there was that whole year where we actually had the CNC here. There was that too. We did have the CNC. And I had to pretend to be a machinist. Mm-hmm. But that stopped because okay. we want we need you to be a designer. Um, so Elliot spends a lot of time now sitting at his computer and just clicking away in SolidWorks and coming up with stuff. Sometimes, and then I do this. I do this thing right when when I think a design because it, it has to go through some proofing on my end first. So it's like, hey, I've got an idea for some shapes, and then shapes become three dimensional objects. Then three dimensional objects become engineered components, and then engineered components, if they look weird to me, I go, hmm, maybe this is not one I showed to Christopher. But when there's one that I like, I go, all right, Chris. Check this one out. And then he'll usually come in and go, that's retarded. What are you thinking? And then I have to explain it. Do you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is there a creative back and forth uh, other than that's retarded? Like uh, where, where you say, oh, maybe you should yeah. add a chore yeah. or perhaps. Yeah. Like, yeah. You make me sound like such a dick. Well, he phrases things really nicely now. <laughs> he, he, instead of going like that's something should be here. He goes, can there be something here? And I go, yes, there can be something here. What do you think should go there? And or I think what if we remove this. this part here? <laughs> That's an interesting looking feature. I bet that took a while to render, but does it really need to be there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe you're right, Chris. So would you call yourself both engineers? Or are you both on the engineering side? Elliot, you do a lot of the design or all of the design. And Chris, it seems like you do a lot of the implementation. I don't mean to like pigeonhole you here, but I'm just trying to figure yeah. out this process. So, um, <laughs> And then once that happens, how, where do you go from there? That is, that is the $50 million question. Where does it go from there? So I try to uh, steal away hours in the day to design stuff as much as I possibly can because there is a process to the whole thing. And then it becomes a selection process, at least for me, and I usually try and include him on this. And I say, one of the things that I present to him is, here's this. I think this is going to work well for X. Either that is a Ferrum Forge Knife Works mean California design, or that is a Pro Series design, or we should throw this off to in the Ferrum Forge design category. So that could go to, you know, a drop, it could go to Wee Knife, it could go to a bunch of other different companies that have asked me for design work at this point. And so it's part of trying to control a little bit of what we get out there in the market and to make sure that, um, we want to give companies that come to us for design work, we want to make sure that they're getting a design that is going to be marketable hmm. and that they're going to see return on because I too am a business owner and I know there's nothing worse than making a design that nobody buys. Hmm. And so you know, we start from a framework of we want to, we want to design and make knives that people want to own. So if it never fits that criteria or if it's like too out there, like too avant-garde and we just go, yeah, it's cool, but God, who really is going to buy this besides couple of our super fans so what um uh in the design process what inspires you uh is it um is it the thought of how it's going to be used is it an aesthetic first thing you have a a definite design language so this is a great question that's a tremendous question we talk about this all the time actually Uh so we always start from the point of utility Right. A knife is a tool. It has to be able to do its job. It's got to do its job. It's got to come out of the pocket. You got to flip it open, use it, put it back all safely. Uh, So first and foremost, it has to function well. Um, And then the challenge with everything is blending the the form and making it look cool and interesting and unique. You know, make sure it looks good in pictures, whatever it is to blend that into the function. Because we are very well aware that we exist in a very digital world. And the likelihood that someone is actually going to touch a knife before they purchase it 
is ever dwindling. So it has to look good in a picture on a website. So if it doesn't look good in a picture on a website, nobody's going to get that knife in their hand to see how useful and see how nice it is. So it's this this balance now to that has to be struck, at least from my point of view, has to be struck where not only does it have to be functional and useful and all of the stuff has to be there, the action, the feel, the sound, the ergonomics, how it feels in your hand, but it also has to look good. And sometimes that can be a challenge because sometimes there are things that feel great, but just look very silly or vice versa. There are things that look amazing, mm -hmm. but when you put them in your hand, it's just like, ow, why would someone do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Didn't someone with hands design this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's interesting. Uh, the aesthetic, I, I have never heard anyone, I haven't heard anyone say that yet. I mean, I've, I've heard people say, yes, I designed with aesthetics first in mind, or I designed it as a tool and uh, strictly, uh, but the idea of it being designed aesthetically pleasing so that it looks good on a website. It's of course, I, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, because that's exactly how I buy it. Oh, my God. How is it going to get in someone's hand if you don't look at it and go, hmm, that looks nice. Hmm. And, and your knives, uh, the Ferrum Forge knives across the board look comfy. I have to be totally honest. I don't have any of them. Um, I I am really wanting the Mordax. That yes. Is a beautiful, beautiful looking knife. And uh, I'm a sucker for and curious about the push button thing. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Just put it right through the, yeah. yeah put it should. right through the mic. I'll take it. <laughs> you, you really should. You should treat yourself because um, <laughs> it's fantastic. So what is your, what is your favorite of, of all of your designs? I hate, and, this, uh, uh, I hate <laughs> this question. Damn it. It's a hard question. They're like his babies, right? Let's see. The Mordax, the Gent, the Archbishop, the Crux, the Dow, the Falcon, the Fortis, the Malice. There's still, there's even uh, well, there's, I gave there's you my more. Mordex, and I love the the Dow is so cool looking. Okay, of the of the uh, drop formerly mass drop designs, the Dow is actually my favorite. I, I when I designed the the Buck and the Dow simultaneously because I was asked to do something that had that cleavery looking shape to it, and I went, well, if I'm going to do that, it's got to be useful. I, I hate cleaver looking knives that don't have a nice point to them. I want this to still be fun and and ultimately useful at the end useful and so i designed that one i went now what happens if i just take this the thing off the top there oh oh hello what a lovely looking sheep horn clip kind of thing well let's do that one too so it it became my favorite i actually do carry that one quite a bit when i don't have to have other prototypes in my pockets so are you all do you always are you guys always carrying uh some ferrum forge uh designed or produced knife just to kind of make sure it's up to snuff and that kind of thing oh well, yeah like we actually just got a box of prototypes in today and so it's going to be nothing but prototypes in our pockets for at least the next two weeks okay so if you weren't carrying your own knives whose knives uh would you be carrying oh that's a really really good question okay let me let me make it a little easier who are your heroes who are your mentors who are your heroes heroes well, i can give you some names of people that uh have influenced me in positive ways. Not to be exclusive of people that I'm friends with, um, but there are some guys that have a, of a, an aesthetic that I've always really appreciated. And there's some that I think are, are um, underrepresented today. Dave Mosier is a, is a knife maker that I've always just really appreciated what he does. Chris is going to disagree with me on a bunch of these. We, we like different things. Um, <laughs> no, I'm a fan I, of Dave. I, I really do like what Tashi Baruka does a lot. I mean, this is why we're friends. I always appreciate his aesthetic. Tashi's very different than us. He's in it's aesthetic different. first, function second. There, there are some like unknown people that I follow on Instagram that, mm -hmm. that make a couple of designs that I just really, really dig. And they're like one guy is French. I can't even pronounce what his, his Instagram handle is. And uh, like he, he just does like this really simple, elegant looking stuff that I'm just like, yeah, I love that. Love that. Simple. It's good. Mm -hmm. And then there are some things like Korth Cutlery. I appreciate for Rick Lala's overall design capabilities. And then his cut his nephew. Yeah, his nephew, Rudy Lala, for his carve work. Like Rudy is a giant piece of inspiration for my artistic carve work type stuff. Do you say car carve work? Yeah. Okay. Carve work. Um, I've liked Flavio Acoma for a long time, ever since I discovered him. 
he also does some carb titanium work, which he is quite masterful at. Yeah, those those would be the knife makers that, that really trip my trigger. And I'd like, since I do know Ken Onion, and I have owned a lot of Ken Onion design knives in my life, I mean, it's hard to not mention him. And ha- now that I know him, like, he's an interesting cat. Oh, shit, that's right, R.J. Martin. I always forget about him. Also, oh, right, a guy that now that I finally met, and he is he's a really uh, fantastic person. His knives are disgustingly beautiful. And they, like... In the early days, like when I was setting up how the internals of a knife were going to work, like one of the people that I looked at was RJ because his his stuff always flips gorgeously, and um, he he just really nails the he nails the engineering on stuff every time. Okay, I think I I think I did it. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's he's a he's a, I could you know, he's an inspiration because it's uh, they're they're like I said, they're incredibly beautiful knives. I'd love to have a stag handled RJ Martin, anything, but they look beautiful, but also to know how, how uh, adept, you know, the engineering is. Well, and I would say those are my, my modern makers. Like there's, there's people that um, maybe I don't even know if they make knives anymore that like art knife makers. Like one of the first people that turned my head was Jim Schmidt. You know, I believe Jim is dead now. Pretty sure. And like the, there were folders, art knife folders from him back in the day. And I was just like, holy crap, like that's incredible. So you've been a full-time knife making outfit, uh, not doing any other day job or whatever since 2012 or so. Is that right? Yeah. in like summertime of 2012, right about this time, actually, back in 2012. Seven solid years. So how have you seen the knife world change since you entered in uh, as freshman? A lot, a lot, a lot. I would say, I mean, I it, it feels sea change level a lot where do we even begin with this oh this this is a big question this is a huge question as a guy who kind of started his folder career on youtube i mean there's there's a couple of us it would be like myself uh michael gavick gavco knives uh Mm -hmm. jeff blavelt tough knives um we'd like we were really sort of people that were doing knifery and making videos about it and putting it on youtube Mm -hmm. and uh the three of us are friends at this point um, because there wasn't too many people that were actually doing that. And since then, uh, I, th- I think we've we've only done like one real platform change, and that was to to get on Instagram. As they advised me, it was actually Jeff Blavelt who was like, "You got to get on Instagram, dude. It's like perfect for knife makers because then you can just like take a picture with your phone when you're in the middle of stuff and post it. Boom, it's cool." And I was like, <laughs> "Actually, that sounds like a pretty reasonable idea." He's not wrong, but since more and more people now have a miniature computer in their pocket. More and more people now get to see how not production companies function. And so you can see a guy in his garage doing the stuff and things that make a knife. And then you can follow silly people like us. And then you can see how we do it at a slightly higher level. And uh, we've, we try to be as transparent as possible so people like know, like when we say, hey, this is made at our machine shop that's a mile down the road, it really is made at the machine shop that's a mile down the road. Here's the, like, so I think we've had guest appearances and things from like the head machinist there, like swings by. And we're like, oh, hey, why? Since we were filming this video, look, there's the head machinist, the, you know, the shop we use. Uh, but that, uh, that opening up, um, pulling back of the curtain a little bit, has expanded the kind, the interest level in knives as well as sort of this might be tough to put into words turned it from some sort of like closeted i love my knives and my guns and i'm gonna go sharpen them in the basement to hey look at this thing that a person made and isn't it an incredible piece of art slash engineering slash craftsmanship look at this thing right it's what's the right one i'm looking for luxurious hmm. i don't know it's also inherently appealing as a human being. Uh, knives, you know, it, it, does, it, it does not take long to get people warmed up to a beautiful knife. You pull out a skanky looking kitchen knife and, and threaten someone with it. Of course, they'll have a reaction. You pull out a ferrum forge, you know, some beautiful, beautifully engineered, beautifully designed and produced knife. They're going to be, wait, wait a sec. What's that? What That's that? a pocket knife. You know, I mean, people seriously. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's not the one like my grandpa used to carry. Right. It's, it's, it's funny. Sure. You started the whole yeah. knife story off with your grandpa. It's so, it's so funny how many knife stories start start off with grandpas. I hope, 
I hope to have grandchildren someday, and I hope they start some stories. Bless the grandpas that give knives to their children. Absolutely. It's a wonderful thing. If there's any grandpas out there listening, give your grandchildren knives. Yes. Teach them how to use it responsibly, but give them knives. Absolutely. I, I think that's a uh, tradition that will, uh, that will never, ever go. Excellent. We talked about your work with um, Drop, but uh, I, I want to talk about the Mordax in particular uh, because you worked with Protec, who um, I have a couple of their knives, and I'm a big fan of their automatic knives, even though I can't carry them where I live. Us too. Us too. It's positively ridiculous. Yeah, I know. E- except you can carry the real real small ones, right? Yes. Like yes, we, we like the real small ones. And I'm, I'm pushing on Protec that like maybe they should let me design some more California legal autos. Can we, can we please, can we please let's do it. How, how was it working with them? They're right up the street basically, right? Yeah. They're like an hour and a half away from us. So I have known their CEO, Dave Wattenberg, maybe like since 2014. So I've known him for a solid five years. And he was one of like the first people that I went up to at a show. And I was like, Hey, I'm so-and-so I make knives in my, garage or you know i started a little company and he was like really welcoming really nice and i've also owned protec knives in my my youth some that i didn't even realize were protec knives until years down the road when i'm mm-hmm. in dave's office going when did you guys make that knife oh we did that in like uh like 2000 he's like 2005 the, or something i went what that happened like four months ago when we were yeah that was like four months ago yeah. no it was <laughs> earlier than 2005 it was like 1998 and i was like you so that came out in '98 because I'm pretty sure I had one of those when I was in high school. I'm I'm almost positive. I'm like, did you do one with holes in it? He's like, yeah, yeah, that was '98. I'm like, I had one of those. I'm like, damn, I've been a fan of yours so since cool. way back. Uh, but like every time I talked to Dave, he would always ask me like, what's in your pocket? What are you What are you guys working on? And then I would show him whatever I had in my pocket. And in 2015, one of that was the the Mordax, and he went, wow, that's actually a really nice design, Elliot. I like that a lot. And I said, okay, cool. It's yours. It's your design. I'm not going to make it again. And so how, however it gets made again, it'll be you doing it. And he went, all right, good deal. So that was in 2015. Trust forward. And I recognize that, uh, that ProTech makes ProTech knives and they uh, are very efficient in the way that they make knives. Um, it's, it's very, very cool to see how efficient they have become. And they they have their lane and they stay in it. And so there's some what's what's the right word? They're resistant to change a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. So it just so happened in 2000 was that 17 or 18? It was 2017. We were at the California Custom Show and they had just come out with the Cambria button lock flipper. And button lock flippers have a couple of, of challenges to overcome to make them feel like a framework to have that snappy detent feel. And and it was one that I was already starting to think about. And I was, I had all these ideas. I'm going to re-engineer the button and it's going to have all these little catches on it. And there's going to be the space to do this thing. Just way too crazy. So I went, Dave, I, I think you've done it. I think you've solved it. And I, I, this, is a, this is one of the snappiest button lock flippers I've ever touched. Congratulations. And I said, what if we did the Mordax as a button lock flipper? And then I reached behind me and grabbed our project manager from Mashrop who was with me. And I went, and what if we make Mashrop pay for it? <laughs> and he goes, hmm, there you go, Elliot. Now you're talking. And then so it was just, it was a, an interesting design process because they don't actually use CAD. All of their stuff gets done in a CAM system. And so I got to meet their engineer, their head engineer. I'm sorry, what's CAM? CAM? Computer-aided manufacturing. So it's the actual computer program that generates the G code that goes into a machine. And so they usually have a, a, a 3D design component in them because you have to be able to look at a design and then go, how is this get made by the machine? And it usually good cams will give you some idea of here's the tool pathing you should use for this. Do you okay. want to optimize? And so they, they run a, a system called MasterCam, which is a pretty expensive program, actually. And so that's that's that was the only way that we could really look at each other's work. So I would send them a fully realized 3D render and then... I would get back 3D wire drawings that had no solid bodies whatsoever. <laughs> and so I have to show this stuff to mass drop, like the changes that have been made for engineering purposes. <laughs> and so then I had to like <laughs> completely, I had to go in and like measure every single line and create. Uh, re-render it. Re-render it 
<laughs> so I could show Bash up. Oh, this is what we're doing. <laughs> and, keeping uh, you sharp, keeping your skills sharp. Yeah. Very, very much so. I have uh, yes, two pages practice. of notes good in practice. my uh, in my notebook of of all the different measurements that I had to take to to re render that thing as as true to what they were going to manufacture as possible. And so there was a, an interesting process, but through that, you know, I'm emailing back and forth with this guy, and he in the one day he's just like, "I like you." And I was like, "Thank you, I like you too." And then we went and visited, and we've been threatening to go and visit and mess around at Dave's shop for years, and we finally did it. And uh, Gary's desk looks exactly like mine. It is just full of stuff and things, just <laughs> tools and parts of knives and hardware and calipers, and it's like, I'm like, "Yeah, I feel that, Gary." That's exactly what my desk looks like. It's a shit show. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, I've got a lot of my mind. I'm always doing a bazillion things at once. And I go, I understand completely. And so in that, in that same visit, like we're supposed to be there, like taking pictures and, you know, doing some stuff, you know, for, for the marketing team there at Drop. And, and it really, I just end up geeking out with the hand engineer for, for most of the time. I'm like, where the hell is Elliot? Where's Elliot? And I'm in his office and I'm, he's showing me stuff. He's like, look at this crazy texture I came up with. Dude, this is, how cool is that? And I'm like, that is a really nice texture, dude. How long did that take you to do? He's like, too long. Way, way too long. I wasted so many days doing that. I'm like, that's a cool texture though. Thanks, man. We should, we should do, we should do more work together. I'm like, I agree. We should. And so hopefully that will come true. I, I would really like to do more with Brotech. I, I, it seems, uh, at least from the, from the Mordax, uh, like a natural fit. I mean, the design and then, and like the way it looks and the way it seems to function with the button lock seems to be just right on. We've talked about, uh, uh, how social media has changed the knife world. Let me ask you this. Uh, I just got my very first custom knife uh, a couple weeks ago and I, I went to the shop of the, the man who made it for me and it's awesome and I love it. Uh, attention to detail mercantile awesome uh gentleman's assassin knife if if you will from from your perspective i mean okay since since you're dealing with knife production on many different levels from making them with your own hands to having them produced and designed at, at various uh manufacturers custom quality versus this insane high quality production like we knives like riot and reich and those kind of companies how do they compare? How does custom quality compare to this incredible production quality we're seeing? So I'll tell you, I'll answer this question as an anecdote. So the thing that uh, made me email We Knife Co. was one of our customers who has a great deal of our knives um, that spanning all the price ranges we have knives in brought me a We 601. And said, Elliot, he's left-handed. Can you put the clip on the left-hand side for me? I said, yeah, sure. I'm going to have to drill and tap some holes and stuff. But yeah, sure. I'll, I can get on there for you. So I had the knife apart. I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh, oh, hello. Oh, my. This is incredibly well done. And I'm measuring things because I'm a freak like that. Measuring stuff going, oh, oh, geez. Oh, wow. This this company has, has figured some things out. They're doing some stuff that's really, really nice. Like, they have attention to surface finish on the inside of a knife. Wow. We don't see that too often coming out of the Far East. And that precipitated me sending them a DM on Instagram, social media, and um, because I knew that they followed me on Instagram. And then they were like, oh, yeah, we totally do OEM. Let's talk. And I was like, I would love to get see what's up in your place. And then I got a chance to meet their CEO. And he looks at a knife the exact same way that I do like all up in its insides and just way, way up close. And I went, hmm, now I see fellow knife nerd. Excellent. Just so happens to have a lot of employees and a lot of machinery. And so in the time that we've been working with We Knife in specific, I have to say that they are down with the details just as much as we are. I mean, they, they really are. They're really, they're knife nerds. They really are. And so you get what you ask for. And so the more detailed you can be in your requests and, and say, no, no, do this like it is in render. And no, no, this is the color I want. And that's the screw that I want. And I want it to look like this. And that's what I want. So the more specific that you can be, the better the overall product ends up becoming. And we go through uh, rounds of prototyping before we ever say yes to production. And that carried over as well when we were doing stuff with uh, Drop, formerly known as Mastron. Uh, it was, no, no, just prototype it, and then we'll look at it. But in the render, yeah, well, renders are renders. Real is real. Prototype it. Send it over. And so we would go through rounds of prototyping before we were 
everybody was satisfied with something. And we, we do that to this day. Like we just got a box full of prototype stuff in and some things are great. Some things need improvement. And so in the years that I've been working with, we it's been about creating the, uh, solving the language barrier and then creating a language within the way that we work together so that they know when I say some off the wall thing, like uh, I need it to be rounder. You need to develop a shorthand. They go, Oh, you mean you need this fillet to be, yeah, yeah, that's what I need. And so, well, I don't think they're, they have, they have two engineers that work there. I, I'm going to make these guys famous. Um, <laughs> they're named Calvin and Odin. Odin. Yes. Yes. They have a Norse God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it could be part of the reason for the success. Yeah, man. Jeez. I don't know if he has one eye or not. Um, I look forward to meeting this person in person. Uh, but like, so they don't really speak English, but we definitely speak the language of CAD and design and what is actually possible in manufacturing. So one of the other keys that I have to making sure that we're getting the best quality product that we can out of an outsourced manufacturer is knowing what's possible and what's not and not asking them to do something that is just over the top and it has to be a hand operation. And so nobody's going to really love doing that job. Just like I wouldn't love doing that job. So I never asked them to do something that I wouldn't do myself. And especially in a production setting, because we have done uh quasi production level stuff here, you know, where we're doing a 200 piece run. And so there's not a lot of room to have immense amounts of hand time in products because it has to go through its processes in order for it to eventually become a full and complete knife. Nice. And while everything we make here always has hand time in it, it's it's like, okay, how do we not spend an hour on each part? Right. Well, that's, I think, I think you're touching on it right there. The, um, to me, the difference is intangible. It's uh, you, you might get uh, this sick precision quality from Wii knives, for instance, but the time that you spend, even if you're only spending uh, l less than an hour per part or whatever you're saying, you know, the, the, the time that has, is uh, that that knife is spending in your hands is, this is going to sound flaky, woo woo, but it's, you're, you're kind of uh, imbuing a little bit of yourself in there. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like a painting as opposed to a reproduction Monet, you know. This is also one of the reasons why we insist on quality assuring each knife mm -hmm. that goes out the door. Like I can't do that with the mass drop stuff, but all the pro series stuff, we collectively handle each freaking knife ad nauseum. The, the pro series. Uh, tell me what that is exactly. That was us going, wow, we have these great relationships with, especially with we knife and we should really make sure that we're capitalizing on our capability to interact with them. It was so much simpler for me. It was, <laughs> wait a minute. There's good quality. We can offer our customers a still a very premium, high quality product at half the cost. Yeah. So it was just one of these things like that's what we always want to do. It's kind of a no duh kind right, of moment. Like offer oh, offer people oh, the yeah, best yeah. product that we can at the lowest cost that we can. So everything really came together in the the proper way and at the right time for us to launch our own production series, the Pro Series. One of the things that we liked about We Knife in specific was they were they were actively trying to eliminate the the notion that if it comes from China, it must be cheap, mm -hmm. and it must be terrible quality. They've done an outstanding job. The reality is, is China will make what you tell them to make, and so we've demanded lowest cost goods from them for so long that that's just what they got used to making. And uh, part of like. Joe, the CEO at We Knife, part of his story is he was he was doing that kind of thing, and he went, "Wait a minute! Like when I go to these knife shows, I'm seeing these products that are just amazing, and I know that we can make them. Why don't we just try making them and see what happens? I mean, they're going to be more expensive than sixty dollars, but why don't we try and do it and see what we can do? And there were a couple of other people that were doing that at the, almost the exact same time. David Dang over at uh, Riot. The guys at Reich Knife were thinking the same thing. Like, wow, we have all of this capability. <laughs> like, we make, we literally make parts that are in outer space. Why can't we make a high quality knife too? So, and then do it in such a way where if it's our own designs or it's unique designs. So we're not, you know, ripping off people. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they're, they're actually very aware that, uh, that that has happened so much that it right, has, right. you know, kind of, there's, there's still a little taint in there in the market from, from, 
from that era. And there are still companies that are doing it. Sure. I mean, at this point, I get reached out to by companies of all sorts overseas. And it's the first thing I do is go to the website and see what are they offering? Do they have clone shit on there? Sorry, I can't work with you. Sorry, guys. No. Yeah. Well, okay. So before we wrap, let me ask you guys, your brothers, you must have some stories. Funny, <laughs> ridiculous, inspiring knife story. <laughs> Oh, it's well, inspiring, all right. <laughs> it, yeah, I guess you call it's, it inspiration. This is a good not, not quite a knife, but uh, we did have an incident with a samurai sword and a golf ball. I like it already. <laughs> oh, yeah, it gets real special. So this this is when I was in high school. Um, so not real bright, uh, not real good at making decisions. And uh, somebody gave you a, like a a decorative you know, katana thing that had this giant brass cobra head at pommel. Still have the brass cobra head. I still have it. It's still here. That makes it more deadly, guys. It's 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was in the backyard. I was uh, chipping golf balls into a bucket or attempting to. And Elliot comes in with the sword and he's like, dude, I sharpened it. Hit the golf ball at me. I'm going to cut it in half. (laughs) (laughs) To which high school dumbass me goes, yeah, this is going to be great. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? All right. In my defense, I had – there was a wall that I was ready to dive behind. I had prepared a little <laughs> bit. But so we're like, sure, why not? So I hit a couple at him, swing and a miss. Uh, baseball was our dad's sport, not Elliot's sport. No. Not at all. Um, he connected with one, and it just disappeared over the fence. Like, ah, crap. Then we hit another one. You got it. It stayed in the yard, and it didn't quite cut all the way through. All the way through. So. He was like, all right, I'm definitely I'm, coming I'm through on this it now, time. buddy. It's two in so, a row. Let's do this. <laughs> for those listening, Elliot has never been a small fella. Uh, at that point in time, 6'5", 250, 260. well into my 20s and well into college athletics. So I was not small. I two, would have been uh, 260 plus. Yeah, two, no, I'm closer to 280. Yeah. So Real. he puts everything he has Real. into this swing. <laughs> um oh yeah <laughs> so the ball not so much but uh the blade of the sword comes oh. out of the handle oh. and just starts helicoptering through the air <laughs> <laughs> oh. and like fortunately it kind of went out away from me uh so we're both standing there and just watching this blade fly through the air <laughs> i knew the- something had gone wrong terribly wrong when the cobra head fell to the ground in front of me and I was like, that's weird. Oh, the it's gone. The blade is gone. Oh, <laughs> sh- oh, sh- it's okay. We didn't hit any houses or anything. It just hit the back fence. Uh, nobody was harmed during this incident. I would say that I got a solid, uh, like a uh, hundred yards of travel out of that. I think yeah. The I really club went did. further than the ball. <laughs> Wait, real, real good. Real far there. Woo, look at it go. So, so that was a really special brother moment. And I think that was one of the things that set the uh, tone for me to be the serious, more responsible brother. You're going to have to expect that when you when you buy a, a samurai sword, a, a subpar samurai sword. with, a, with Well, a we combat. didn't know at the time. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> because uh, who among us didn't have one of those? Or the, um, uh, the one I had was the... Uh, 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 Highlander. It was the same thing. It had a ridiculously yeah. long hilt, but with the dragon on the end, mm-hmm. and uh, never winked it at my brother. But uh, man, I <laughs> thanks, that. bro. <laughs> well, uh, guys, I, I want to thank you for coming on the the Knife Junkie podcast. I think what you're doing is really interesting. You're like truly diversified knife outfit. Um, you know, from from the stuff that uh, that everyone can afford to the stuff that you're making by hand. It's really impressive. And uh, I'm glad you were able to come on the show. Thanks very much, guys. It's been a Thank pleasure. you for having, for having us. us. And there's more to come. Excellent. Oh, we'll be got a lot more. more. And uh, when I get the Mordax, which I will, I will brag and carry it around. And you need to get videos. it. Yes, you, you have to absolutely it. should get it. Uh, yes. It's breathtaking. <laughs> it's breathtaking indeed. All righty, guys. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, man, I'm telling you, Bob, what, what an interview. The brothers there, Fair and Forge. Uh, you've got brothers. You know how it is. So that kind of playing off each other kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. They they are a tour de force, and uh, I do have a brother. And I was I was wondering the whole time we were talking, what would it be like if Vic and I were sitting here talking to someone? 
Um, and it would probably look about the same. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. You know, there's a lot of shorthand, a lot of inside jokes and a lot of history there. But right. um, I got to say, talking to them really got me excited because they're um, they're kind of. Uh, uh, what do you want to say? Blazing their own trail. You know, they're doing they're doing things that have been done before in a way that have never been done before. <laughs> mm. They're bringing together all these different uh, production modes. And well, just to make it about me for a second, <laughs> being an <laughs> well, artist is the knife junkie podcast. Oh, hey, <laughs> being an artist uh, my whole life, but also being someone who is always cycling through interests. I, I could really relate to how they've kind of spread themselves out and allowed them to keep knife making. Uh, this exciting activity. If they get tired of uh, making knives in their shop, uh, well, they can they can shift their work to design work for uh, for their mid tech line. And if they get tired of that, well, they can call up Pro Tech or or Drop and and say, hey, let's uh, let's do another collaboration. So they they've uh, built in options to their career. And I think is very interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, a lot of uh, not not. I don't want to. Say, I guess the first word that came to mind was pigeonhole, but not that's not the right word. But it's mm-hmm. not just solely one niche. They've got uh, several areas they can spread out. Right, right, exactly. And I'm uh, I'm no master investor, uh, master investor, but they do say to diversify, and these guys mm-hmm. are doing that. Yeah. Well, that's going to put the, uh, the the what do they call it? the wrap on uh, another episode of the podcast. But I do want to remind our listeners that uh, uh, Bob does a newsletter almost every week. We try to get it out on Mondays or maybe Tuesdays, start the week off with some knife junkie news and information. So if you want to get on the knife junkie uh, newsletter list, just go to the knife dot com slash subscribe and you can uh, enter your email address and uh, we'll send you the newsletter. We promise we won't spam you with any other kind of stuff. The knife junkie newsletter knifejunkie.com slash subscribe. Bob, anything to finish up the show with? Uh, well, I know I buried this one in the ground too, but uh, I hope to have that uh, Ferrum Forge slash drop slash protect more dax in my pocket as soon as the next run comes out. Okay. And I'll, I'll let everyone know and you'll okay. hear me clicking it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and probably have to do a video on it too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.